Hello, my name is Dwayne Spearman. Welcome to Directional Bible Ministries. This is a teaching ministry that is called to rightly divide the Word of God for the people of God. And to, today we find ourselves still in the book of Ephesians. Last time we were together, uh, we looked at, uh, it was in session three, and uh, we got down, let me take a look here. Looks like we got down through verse number nine. So today we're going to pick up in Ephesians chapter number one, and we're going to take a look at verses 10 and 12, hopefully. Uh, in our study today, uh, we're going to take a look at the dispensation of the fullness of times when God gathers all things together in him and the inheritance that has been predestined that we have been predestined to have. Uh, and it is to the praise of his glory. Didn't read that quite right, did I? Um, and the inheritance that we have been predestined that we might be the praise of his glory. There we go. Um, hopefully I said that right. So uh, this will be session four, uh, verses 10 and 12. So last time we got down through verse number nine, where he says, having made known unto us the, us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. So there is a lot of disagreement about when the fullness of times is or will be. Um, in the past, recent past, I must say, I have thought that the fullness of the dispensation of times when he does all this would be during his thousand-year millennial reign. But as I take a closer look at this and I listen to other Bible teachers, there's some disagreement about that. Because by its very definition, I don't think it can be referring to a time that still needs to be fulfilled or at least a time that we know about. Because it seems that it is referring to a time that we don't know about, which would be beyond what we know about. Well, as far as we know, is up to Revelation chapter number 22. Uh, so to say that it's the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, well, we know about that. Matter of fact, we know when it's going to start. We know what's going to happen during that time. We know how it's going to culminate, how it's going to end. That's explained to us in the book of Revelation. So Paul seems to be referring to what is beyond the Messianic kingdom. Uh, the NIV actually translates that, you know, the nearly inspired version, it translates that to put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. And at that time, he will gather together in one all things which are in heaven and which are in earth, even under him. So again, I don't it can't be referring to the time of the millennial reign because all things aren't necessarily under him during that time. There's rebellion. There's people that are living that are contrary to him. He's ruling with a rod of iron. He's having to discipline people. There's uh, still death as far as we can tell. Uh, there's believers and unbelievers. Um, I mean, it just doesn't seem like uh, all things are gathered in him, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. So it doesn't seem like, it seems like that in the dispensation, the fullness of times, it would be after that. It'd be beyond what we know, beyond Revelation chapter number 22, when everything truly is under his feet. It'll be under his leadership, both the earthly promises made to Israel and the heavenly promises made to the body of Christ. And again, if you look in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 9, he says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Well, again, during the thousand-year millennial reign, not every knee is bowing of things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess 
Now that will happen, but it'll happen after, I believe, the thousand year millennial reign. It'll happen after the great white throne judgment. Um, so I think this is beyond that. He says, in that every tongue, Philippians 2.11, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, so Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and visible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him, because he was before all those things, and by him all these things consist. So all these things would have to be under him, uh, and, and again, in submission to him. So again, I, I just don't see that happening during the millennial reign of Christ when he's on the earth. And if you read the book of Hebrews, you can see that. Uh, Hebrews 2, 5 through 8 seem to be also referring to this. Uh, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come wherever we speak. But one certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the Son of Man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and you did set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. I mean, to me, again, that's beyond um, the thousand-year reign of Christ, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see um, not yet things put under him. So again, I think this is referring beyond. It's, a, it's describing a time after the thousand-year reign of Christ. So just take a look at that verse one more time. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times. So when is the dispensation of the fullness of times? After the millennial reign of Christ. It is eternity. Uh, and again, we don't know anything about that. It, it's pretty fuzzy. He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, and those heavenly things, um, you know, where the, the church will be, and those earthly things, which is where Israel will be, all of that will be in him. And you know, so I think that um, I think it's safe to say that this dispensation of the fullness of times is after the millennial reign of Christ on earth. Um, and again, uh, it's interesting that word dispensation again. You see that? Let's see that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's an interesting word. It's a controversial word. People don't like that word. But in the King James, it has dispensation. Now, the only other translation that uses that same exact word is the New King James. The New King James keeps that exact word. But the other translations change it for something else. Um, the NIV says, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment. Uh, the ESV, that verse number 10, says, as a plan for the fullness of time. So, so one is a plan, <laughs> uh, and then the NIV uh, says it's put into effect, something that's put into effect, which is a plan, which is a dispensation, which is a, the word dispensation speaks of a dispensing. Um, let's see, that word dispensation, KJV plus here. Um, notice that in the dispensation, that's an administration, an economy, a stewardship. So that in the, economy, the dispensation, in the plan of God. But that word dispensation is still in the Bible, you know, and a lot of people don't like that word. And, of course, they describe you and me as we are dispensationalists, 
as opposed to if you're not a dispensationalist, then you are a covenantalist. And, of course, that would encompass Reformed types. Uh, They believe that God works in covenants, and we believe God works in dispensation dispensations. Now, personally, as someone who um, is what you would call a dispensationalist, some would even accuse me of being a hyper-dispensationalist, which is fine. Uh, that just means that I take it one step further. Um, they, I don't believe God works in covenants because the Gentiles have nothing to do with covenants. The covenants were not made with you and me unless we're spiritual Israel. So you got to make us Israel in order to get us into the covenants. Well, we're not Israel, never been, never will be. Uh, We are the body of Christ made up of Jew and Gentile. Israel, the nation, remains separate from us. So, you know, they don't like that word dispensation, but that's okay. It's found in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's found in the Bible. I believe it's in there at least four times, as a matter of fact. Um, let's see, the word dispensation. Let's see, bam, four times the word dispensation is found in the Bible. So to say we're dispensationalist is biblical. Now notice in verse number 11, Let me get back over here to my King James here. So he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now that's that's deep because if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, what's the very first verse of the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heaven and he created the earth. And he's telling us here, in Ephesians, that he is going to bring everything in heaven and in earth in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So, in whom? Now, again, that in whom, who's the whom there? Well, speaking of Christ in the previous verse, in whom? In Christ also, we have obtained an inheritance. We have an inheritance in Christ. The only way we have that inheritance is being is because we are in Christ. You know, um, anyway, I'll, I'll get into that in just a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But the inheritance concerns place, possession, and position. So God has a place, possession, and position that we receive by heredity. In other words, it's not something that we have to work to get. We get it because of who we are in Christ. Uh, We see some hints as to this inheritance when we get over in Ephesians uh, chapter number 3 and verse 6 through 8 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister, that's Paul, according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So this inheritance that we're going to get because we are in him concerns a place, possession, position, and it's received by heredity. And Paul goes on to say that we have this inheritance because we are joint heirs, and we have been predestined to it by the council of his own will. We have this inheritance because we are now children of God and joint heirs with Christ. And understand, again, that word predestined is not referring to whether or not you're predetermined to go to heaven or hell, but it's it's about the things that he has for us 
who have been called, responded, and chosen. As we mentioned earlier, it's all about destiny and purpose. It's not about salvation or not. Uh, again, I just think we, we take that word and we make a mess out of it. But we are now children of God and we're joint heirs with Christ. Paul speaks of this in Romans 8 and verse number 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are you led by the Spirit of God? Then you are a son of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. We've been adopted, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit also beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we're the children, then we are heirs. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That word heir, and I've talked about this in previous studies, it doesn't have anything to do. We take the word heir and we apply our Western definition. Or, well, it's not the word heir necessarily. I mean, we are heirs. It goes back to the word adoption. You know, we say we've been adopted, so now we're heirs. And what we do is we take that word adoption and we apply a Western definition to it, which is to say that we were once not a part of the family, but we were adopted and brought into God's family from the outside, and now we're going to receive this inheritance. No, we're already in God's family, and because we're already in that in God's family, one day we're going to walk in that inheritance that he's already predetermined for us. And that word has to do with coming of age. Uh, Romans, uh, you know, Paul talks about the heir is under tutors until the time that he comes of age. What that is, the heir is already in the family. He, he was born into the family. He's already the child. He's already the son. But he's under tutors because he's still a child. But one day he's going to come of age, and when he comes of age, he when he comes of age, he's going to take possession of his inheritance because he already is a son. So again, when we talk about inheritance, when we talk about adoption, when we talk about predestination, it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not we're going to be saved or not. And and again, I, I think we take those words and we jumble them all up and we make a mess out of it because we don't define them properly based upon how they're used in the Bible. Um, so he goes on. Uh, let's see, where am I at? Uh, we have this inheritance because we are now children of God. We're joint heirs with Christ. And then, again, that word predestined is pops up. And again, it's not about heaven or hell. It's about destiny and purpose. Uh, and notice he also says, because this is the counsel of his own will. Notice that in that verse. In whom we have obtained an inheritance. Why? Because we're sons. Okay, and it's interesting in our culture, in our politically correct culture today, I get so irritated with this. We are humans. Humans. We are the race of men. We are all men, you know, but today, you know, we want to call them police women, you know, fire women. It's still correct linguistically to say police man or fire man because we are all men. But political correctness has made us stupid on so many levels. We are the race of men, and there's only one race mentioned in the Bible, and that is the human race. And we make such a big deal out of that. We are the race of men, period. Um, and Paul goes on to say that we have this inheritance as joint heirs, again, because it is by the counsel of his will. Uh, what is the counsel of his will? A counsel, in essence, is a meeting of the minds. Uh, we see it in Acts 2.23, him being delivered by the predeterminate counsel. 
That means the council got together and became of one mind in the foreknowledge of God, and they took him and they crucified him. So wicked men took counsel against God. But this council is speaking of a time in eternity past when the Godhead set everything into motion. In Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it will bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You see, in eternity past, God set all of this into motion. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and you can see some of that. I haven't done this study in a long time. But you can see here, um, notice in, in Genesis 3.22, after, I mean, you can see the Trinity all the way back in the beginning. Uh, even in the very first verse, in the beginning, God, El Elohim, that is the plural name of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And here in Genesis 3, 22, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Lest now he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life, eat and live forever. So the man was going to become like one of us. So God, the counsel of his own will, is speaking of the Godhead in eternity past when he set all of this in motion. In other words, it was all predetermined by God. So God not only knows everything that's going to happen, but he has also predetermined everything that is going to happen. Um, notice also that it's according to the purpose of him. What is the purpose of God? Well, I mean... 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9 says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own what? His own purpose, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So our purpose is in him. It all happened in the predetermined counsel of God before the world began. Acts 2.23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. God knew it. It was already determined. Uh, he mentions this in Ephesians 1.4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So he's already made these decisions. And then notice verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Why has God determined all of this for us? That those of us who have trusted in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So let's look at these verses one more time. Um, session 5, verse number 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather into one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. So this is beyond the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. It's beyond that when all things are subdued, all things are under him, both things that are in earth, things that are in heaven, under the earth, everything. It's all in him. And then verse number 11, in whom, in Christ, also, we have obtained this inheritance. We are predestinated. We are predetermined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And then verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Hope you was blessed by that. And I pray that God blesses you. Remember, he loves you, wants the best for you. And he's working all things out for our good.